Pagu, Chapter 2, Changing Tides, Shifting Tides, and Changing Heights. Pegorus knew little about his sea, though old instinct tried to tell him. It's big, son, he said. Big? To Begu, there was no bigness to it. it. Wasn't it in the whole world? Or on some nights, there were fireworks, the whole world burning with weird, cold flames. Such displays usually began with animals small as pinheads. When disturbed by sudden water movements, their bodies took on a strangely luminous glow. Then instinct sex size copepods caught the urge and twinkled, and other creatures altered them, glow on glow, with big jellyfish lighting up at last like pale round moons. The ghostly fire would spread and build until the sea shimmered with brightness, and huge waves fairly blazed. From this blaze, a few cold sparks might tangle in Pagu's fuzzy places. There the fairy lights would spangle Pagu, the crystal ornaments, a oh, most natural thing in this most wonderful world. But as to a certain push-pull of water, not wind, not waves, tides, said old pal. It's only tides. For six long hours, a flood tide slowly bulges out of the sea and creeps upon the land. Flood tide crowds wide beaches into narrow strips and fills lagoons until boats can float and sail. Then for six more hours, the ebb tide runs flood waters back to sea again. Lagoons drain away until anchored boats settle down on the tide flats and sit there, smack dab in the mud. Sandy beaches spread wider. Their rocks, rocks break the surface and seem to rise like monsters rearing, rearing. Pools are left alone shore to gleam like little lakes. Yet these puddles hold no fresh lake water. When you taste it, the water is very salty. The saltiness grows mo more bitter as the hot sun dries and shrinks the puddles. These tide pools may be as small as a bowl or as big as a duck pond. But once the tide is ebbed away, it begins to return. It floods back to the tide pools and the small animals stranded there. The tidal ebb and flow never ends. Already several days old, Pagu had never been driven ashore. His plankton crowd had somehow held to the open sea. There's the big waves crashing. But one blue-black night, when all the world was flaming with sea fire, wave, wind, and tide almost killed Pagu. At high tide, a strong wind pushed the fire waves into billowing, rolling billions of plankton creatures into them and charged towards land. On the crest of its flood tide, Pagu and his glowing neighbors met the coast. Tons of tiny animals were caught up in surging spray and hurled higher than a house. Splattered with foam against the rocky cliffs, thousands of them stuck and glowed there dimly. Dry air soon put out their little fires, and they flaked away and vanished on the whirling wind. Millions of others were rolled forward, tossed and slapped upon the sandy beach. When the water drained from them, they flopped across great boulders of sand, grain, flickered faintly, and slid off. They died in the canyons between the boulders before the next wave came. Next morning, after the ebb tide, Sand hoppers ate them. Out from the sand with a skip and a dizzy jump, these sand fleas leaped to feast on the pale dead plankton animals. Pagu was not eaten. But he didn't and did not dry out. But old instinct had kept muttering, close, mighty close, too close that time. As Pooh washed hard against the Pagu washed hard against the cliffs. Yet water formed slick cushions under him and slid him down the rocks. Time and again he was dumped onto the beach, but water swirled him, slid him back down the sloping sand to a sea again. Pagu was safe, though. He had almost dry died of wave shock. But wasn't he the son of a two-fisted, fight-loving hermit crab? Well, he was supposed to be, but at this stage even his own parents would not have known him. Pagu was not two-fisted. He had no claws at all, not even legs, nothing but feelers and fuzzy things sticking out. As yet, he was only a promise of becoming a hermit crab, as a caterpillar is a promise of a butterfly. But old pal was right there. Sure, you are just a mite to float on the sea, but look, buck up. You are a promise. Your billions of ancestors have handed down your toughness. You can't be knocked out too early. So 
here's Pagu growing and changing, kind of like a tadpole changes into a frog. And here's a beautiful picture of one of the tide pools. Yet life in this nice salty sea could be dangerous, but old pal advised him, eat son, bring up your weight, eat plenty of meat, go chase with that water flea. So Pagu hunted wiggly game among the plankton game that could be seen even by you, if you squinted. Of course, the wiggly things he chased were at least as small as himself. He had found that most creatures bigger than he was tried to feast on him. In this game, run for your life, you could easily be a goner. Keep on growing, son, urged old pal. You wouldn't have noticed much growth, but Pagu knew he was bigger. As though outgrowing his clothes, he felt overstuffed. And that's dangerous, said Instinct. Something will catch you when you're too slow. What will happen next? Why, you'll just naturally burst wide open. And Pagu did. If the skin of Pagu had been rubbery soft like worm skin, it would have stretched as it grew. But Pagu skin was not soft. It was a tough plastic crust, for he was a crustacean. Because crustaceans, such as shrimps, crayfish, crabs, and lobsters, have crusty skins, they must molt to grow larger. They must burst their cover beans and crawl out of them. Crustaceans molt and come out larger, soft, and wrinkled. Soon they fill out and form crusty coatings again. This happens time and time as they grow. Pagu's brittle armor burst open across his back. He bent double, lashed his tail, wiggled him back to pull all those pesky points and joints out of their plastic prisons. This molting was almost as much trouble as being hatched all over again. But at last he had shred his old skin. It drifted off to sea like a moss tiny wings on a breeze, and Pagu was left soft and new all over. It felt good to be free, to stretch out and expand, and suddenly he was hungrier than ever. It was easy to bring food near his mouth parts now, for he had an extra pair of fuzzy new oars, which were to stir up the sea soup. Pagu, Chapter 2